Do any of you young people know the television series Game of Thrones? Yeah. <laughs> Winter is coming. Yeah, you know that line? If you've read the series of books by George Martin called The Game of Thrones, or if you're an avid follower of the television series, you will know that there is much discussion of past events that, like a pebble that you toss into a pond, has a ripple effect in the events that happen following. And the character of Bran, you may know that young gentleman who was paralyzed, falling out of a tree, has been gifted with the ability to see the past. It informs his decisions in the current time in a way that others can't because he has this ability to see what has happened before. And I think there's always been an interesting kind of tension around history. Is history really history? Is it his story or her story? History is often recorded by the victors of an event. Is it unbiased then, or do some voices get left out? Ask some of our indigenous peoples about how history has been recorded in our own country, and perhaps you will hear a different story. I remember in my church youth group when I was a young person, not much older than many of you, that one Friday night our minister, if you can imagine, got into this big fight between himself and the leader of our youth group. It ended with him storming out of the church, yelling. The 20 of us were quite shocked at what we had witnessed. And it wasn't until the next Sunday in church that we learned that it had been done on purpose. <laughs> done on purpose to teach us about how one event can occur, but when all different people see it happen, they might actually end up describing it differently. Rumors of what had happened had spread like wildfire as everyone told their own version of what they saw. It was very interesting conversation at coffee hour that Sunday. <laughs> I think that this is true of the debate about the what we call the literal interpretation of our scriptures, the stories that we read from our Bible. Most of it is a collection of oral traditions. Those are stories that are just told around a campfire or in people's kitchens from generation to generation. And many records of Jesus' teachings were collected, but only certain ones were canonized or put into the fixed book that we refer to as our New Testament today. And you might know that even in your own families that there are certain stories that circulate over the years. What was a three-pound fish becomes perhaps a 10 or 12 pound fish <laughs> caught from grandpa's favorite fishing hole. Or the distance walked to and from school increase in grade and inclement weather as the years went on. When I was driving around town this past week, I saw a car bumper sticker that said, the older I get, the better I was. <laughs> But no matter the way that we tell the story or the narratives of our lives, they still express some truths that hold meaning for us, which is why the story keeps going. In theological school, the school where Reverend John and I went to learn to be ministers, we had a reference book called The Gospel Parallels. And in it, you could find the different stories of the New Testament Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, side by side, and you could compare how one writer, say Mark, wrote about the feeding of the 5,000 compared to how Matthew recorded that same story. Perhaps there were some different details that reflected the different author and why he wanted to tell that story and what part of it he wanted to lift up to make his own point. But they all described an event where many were fed with very few supplies. So the true meaning was maintained even though the details might have been a little bit different. And the fact that certain stories were all recorded in more than one gospel also speaks to the importance of that event. The writers of the Bible wanted to make sure that we heard that story because they knew it held meaning not only for them, but they felt for future generations. 
In a recent interview by this very old gentleman who you wouldn't know who he is, but his name is Larry King, and most people here would know him, he was interviewing a gentleman by the name of Malcolm Gladwell. And Malcolm Gladwell read such books that we might be familiar with, Outliers, The Tipping Point, David and Goliath. And most recently, he has been doing a series of podcasts called Revisionist History. Revisionist History is Malcolm Gladwell's journey through what he calls the overlooked and the misunderstood. Every episode, he talks or re-examines something from the past, an event, a person, even a song, and asks whether or not we got it right the first time. He writes that sometimes the past deserves a second chance, a second look. Now, I don't know how many of you might know this gentleman here. He's on the front cover of our October edition of our United Church magazine called The Observer. He kind of looks like an older dude, wouldn't you say? <laughs> this gentleman's name was Martin Luther. Now, the Martin Luther that you might be familiar with is not this Martin Luther. What Martin Luther do you think you've heard of? Martin Luther King Jr. Well, he was probably named after this Martin Luther. And this Martin Luther lived 500 years ago. And so it's the anniversary, 500 years ago, since he decided that there had to be a new way for people to relate to God and to worship God in church. And so he started what we call the Protestant Reformation. And he believed it was really important that people could just speak directly to God, that you didn't have to go to a priest or some special person in order to relate to God, that you could just talk to God directly. And he also thought it was important that people should be able to read the Bible in their own language, not just up until then, all Bibles were written in a very old language called Latin. And if you didn't know Latin, you couldn't read the stories of Jesus. So he thought everyone should have a chance to know. So he started a Bible that was written in the language that people could understand. So that was this Martin Luther. So it was important that even for a person like Martin Luther, who really did a lot of great things for our church today, in fact, he wrote some things that were not so great. So as much as we celebrate the anniversary of him starting the Protestant Reformation, there are also some things in our history, if we look back to the things that he said and did, are, were not really good. And he spoke badly about a certain group of people that actually ended up causing others to act in ways with great adversity to people who didn't deserve that. So some people, he was uh, born and raised in Germany, and a lot of his ideas, some people believe, led to the Second World War and the Holocaust and the horrific things that happened to Jewish people in Germany and Europe at that time. So even though he did some good things, if we look back at history, there are other things that he didn't do so well. So history, memories, how we remember are all significant. For some, for instance, Remembrance Day is an issue because they feel it glorifies war, and Noreen sort of spoke about that. But for those who sacrifice their lives and their families, it is important that we remember those people, their loved ones. One of our members here at Trinity, Nancy Yaden, and her sister Cynthia, just this past fall, traveled to an island in France to visit, for the first time ever, their Uncle Bob's grave. He had been killed in the Second World War, and he was only 23 years old, when his ship, the HMC Athabascan, was torpedoed and sunk off the northwest coast of France. And when their dad was at the end of his life, he said to his daughter, you know, I had a brother who died in the Second World War. And Nancy said that, that at that point in her father's life, he was much older, and he didn't really have a very good memory, but he remembered his brother Robert and how he had died. So it was very important to him to have his brother remembered. No one in their family had ever gone to France to see where he had been buried. And so Robert Yaden's mother had mourned his death, and also she had lost, she was one who lost a brother in the First World War. So it's hard to imagine a mom lost a child and a brother in two different wars. John By, a member of our choir here, and his sisters didn't know that their dad's first cousin was killed during the Second World War until one day, 
John Bai was named at a memorial service in their high school Remembrance Day assembly. So you can imagine our John Bai was sitting in high school and all of a sudden somebody says, this soldier by the name of John Bai died and he's looking around saying, what John Bai? I'm John Bai. <laughs> Who's this other John Bai? His father's first cousin had died of his injuries when his Air Force plane had crash landed shortly after takeoff. And he was the only one of his crew to perish in that accident. So he, John Bai, and his sisters traveled this past summer to Pershore, England to see his grave. And you can remember the picture that Reverend John showed of the cemetery. So they went to a, a graveside and they were able to find where he had been buried. And John said that it was a very moving experience. You can just imagine somebody he had never met, an uncle he had never known, a cousin of his dad's. And there they were, the first family to ever see that young man's grave. My experience of grief, and as a minister, Reverend John and I, we often have to be with people at very sad times in their lives, especially when children die. What we've learned is that oftentimes the most important thing for particularly parents is that their child be remembered. Even if a child is only a few seconds old, maybe just lived a day or two, or the memory holds fast not only of who they were, but the younger the person who might have died, there is a sense of mourning about who they might have been. You have, each of you have a wonderful future ahead of you. And it's just so, so sad to imagine some people whose children didn't live to be your age and experience the things that you have. And I would think that Robert Yaden and John By would have been grateful to know that almost 75 years later, their nephew and nieces traveled to the coast of France and England to visit their graves and that their memory and what they sacrificed was remembered, that their lives had meaning. You know, ultimately, I believe that we all have that desire, that our lives matter, whether as an African-American in the United States or an undocumented Mexican worker or an Aboriginal woman who's gone missing or been murdered or a person who has no voice in our society. Every human life is important, unique, meaningful. A report that I watched on a TV show called 2020 said that most of the radicalized young people who end up committing acts of terror, shooting into crowds or driving over pedestrians, are drawn into such terrorist cells because they are promised a sense of community and acceptance, a sense of belonging and purpose that they seem to be missing or lacking in their current lives and they are promised that they will be celebrated and remembered. One of our psalms, one of the poems that's written in our Bible that we like to read says, Lord, you have searched me and known me, for it was you who formed my inward parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them has yet existed. And those words tell us that God knows each of us from the moment we were formed in our mother's womb, that we are all unique and important and special and deeply loved by God. So let each of us remember that our lives matter. Our lives have meaning. As children of our God, the creator, we have a purpose in this world. We are followers of the ways of Jesus. We are called to share stories of our faith Stories that have been told to us of a nation that lived throughout generations and taught to live in ways of justice and love and kindness and humility. They are stories of faith that survive famines and wars and persecution of illness and even death. Because we are a people of faith and hope and we have a story to remember to share with the next generation and a story that we can share together. We do have a history a history at times that we are not proud of. We have not always acted our best selves. We each have our brokenness, and we each make mistakes, and we each have our faults. But we are also a people who believe in truth and reconciliation. We believe in healing and wholeness and doing better. We believe we have a story that will move closer to the peace and ways of justice that God has envisioned for us from the earliest days, like the reading that you gave us this morning from Micah, 
a time then when we will put our swords down and instead we'll pick up rakes and grow vegetables together and share what we have with one another. And so we hope for peace in our hearts and in our homes, in our communities and in our country and even in our world. Gracious God, loving God, may it be so. Amen.